No makeup room today. No makeup. Disappointed. <laughs> The green screen really background, or is it a? No, the, 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 if you want to go see the background, it's the glow. Oh, that's fine. I don't need to see it. That's okay. Okay. Just curious. Oops. I don't know. Oh yeah, it really works. <laughs> so, uh, in my youth, I I ran a grant program in for the state of Illinois. Some people were fairly serious about getting their grants. The mayor of East St. Louis came in and he set his gun on the table. I think this is the modern equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting sound on that? You see the bars going? Yeah. Okay, okay. that's good. Start recording? No. Uh, yes, please. Uh, George, I want to just want to divide things off. We're calling this uh, update on Molokai Land Trust. How's that? That's fine. Um, and there are four parts. Susan, start the timer, will you? Um, and I guess the first part is uh, what's the update? What's the current news and events? The second is to you know Hello, to redefine. Yes, yeah. Can you get it on? Yeah, I, I just left for one hour. I'll be there for one hour. <coughs> uh, just to redefine what it is. Right. And I guess the, the, the third part is uh, any issues or challenges. We can talk about, and the fourth okay, part is the future. Thank you. It's my all-purpose outline. It's great matrix. <laughs> Very <That's> useful. <laughs> People get used to hearing it. Okay. Anyway, uh, thank you for coming down, even on short notice. Susan, put the phone down. We're on the air. Senator Green's coming in, so the Merrill Lynch was calling me to let me know. Okay. Is it, is it running? Thanks for coming down, George. My pleasure. It's Jim. nice to see you. I interviewed some people from Molokai Land Trust a couple of years ago. Oh, did you? In, oh, our, in our earlier, smaller oh, studio. Excellent. Yeah. excellent. So this is kind of a follow-up. Although I don't remember exactly what we talked about, I was very excited about it. Well, it is an exciting prospect for, uh, for Molokai and really for the whole state. Yeah. Well, so t tell us, uh, you know, what's going on. I, I, was, uh, I was calling this, um, you know, um, George Benda. Um, you're the what the CEO or executive director of the Molokai Land Trust? No, I uh, I'm a, I'm on the board of directors. On the board of directors, yes. okay. Who is the CEO right now? Uh, the the chairman of the board is Ricky Cook, mm -hmm. uh, the Cook family. Yeah, the, the old <laughs> families of Molokai. That's not just a coincidence. No, it's not just a coincidence. <laughs> and then um, the executive director is a guy named Butch Haas. And okay. Butch is a great guy. Great guy. We're very, very fortunate to have Butch. So, I mean, just to so people, you know, don't get confused, the Molokai Land Trust is not the Molokai Ranch. Uh, no, absolutely not the Molokai Ranch. Uh, the the properties we currently own are all former ranch properties, mm. but they are now held in public trusts. Uh, hence, the name Molokai Land Trust. And uh, the land trust is a nonprofit organization that that holds the land in trust in order to preserve and and restore it to its. Uh, a pristine character. This is this is very exciting, actually. Uh, it, it is, and you know, we we separate ourselves from Molokai Ranch or Molokai Properties Limited, as they now call themselves. But the land trust exists because of their generosity. Um, even as a resident of Molokai, I find that somewhat surprising sometimes. But it was an extremely uh, bold move by the ranch about six years ago to uh, grant to the community a significant. Um, chunk of land. Tell us what happened six years ago. Well, six years ago, uh, many people in the state will remember a, a, a major uh, upset about something called Laau Point, and Molokai Ranch wanted to develop the southwest uh, coast and, and point. Laau Point the, is on the southwest point of Molokai? Yes. As opposed to uh, the, the, what's the point on the north? West. Ilio. Ilio. I, I've been there. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so the southwest. Right. So, so that, that was the area that they wanted to develop. They, uh, they were 
going through an aggressive program with the uh, local community to receive community input. Um, they received an enormous amount, came up with a plan for the entire 65,000 acres of the ranch. Uh, the and ranch is in the southwest area of Molokai. The ranch is really the western third of the island, right. and then there are parcels scattered through the rest of the island right. as well. And uh, it's a, it's a 65,000 acres is a lot of ground. Yes. Uh, so through the process, uh, Molokai Ranch was in, uh, had proposed to the community that they grant to control of a land trust 55,000 of those 65,000 acres. And the land trust was established. When you say grant, you mean free? Exactly. That's a lot of land for free. Yeah. Oh, okay. Some of it was just easements, but a lot of it was, was outright okay. granted. And so just so that we get the schematic, at the time, I mean, and now, what exactly, what kind of entity is the trust? The trust is, uh, there, there's a whole national land trust movement, and, and this land trust is part of that. There's a Hawaii land trust organization, uh, of which we are not yet part, but, but is, is out there and does similar things. Uh, they are nonprofit, community-based organizations. Uh, they have, they must have a public purpose in order to hold the lands um, and and uh, in trust. Uh, the lands are held in perpetuity, which means that you have essentially fee simple title to them. And uh, we also manage additional lands that might be under lease or they might be other people's ownership. But the land trust itself is anchored by uh, the ownership of the land and then preservation of the natural and cultural values of that land. And, and that's your purpose in the Molokai Land Trust? Absolutely. So it's preservation preservation of the natural value of the land. Right. And as I said, it is a non-profit organization. So the land cannot be developed. It cannot be turned into a profitable uh, uh, enterprise in the, in the sense of a, a, a for-profit business. For, for you personally, George, I mean, um, you know, what's, what's your mission here? Why did you want to be a director? I assume you wanted to be a oh, director. Yes. Oh yes. And I mean, are you? I mean, what? Uh, are you part of the Cook family? Uh, no, no, no. You no. say you're you're living on uh, Molokai. How did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've lived on Molokai for about twelve years now. Okay. And I've been active in in a lot of the efforts to both preserve the island and to uh, promote economic development on the island, so that that the the local economy can be vibrant enough to support itself. Uh, as you know, that's a, that's a major challenge for us on Molokai. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my 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 stake in this, my my uh, reason for getting involved, is it, it is very deeply seated for me. I've been an environmental activist since I was a teenager. My first professional job was back in Illinois. I was a, a uh, uh, field representative for the Illinois uh, Nature Preserves Commission. I was doing exactly the kinds of preservation work that we're doing now. I love that work, uh, but it was not a good career, and I did nothing in it fit me particularly well in terms of my personality and my interests when it came down to actually doing the work. But I loved what the result was. I loved the natural lands, and I loved being outdoors. So on Molokai, the the opportunity is that we're very isolated. We have a lot of remaining natural. Uh, entities, uh, native plants, rare and endangered species, uh, potential uh, nesting areas where they're small use now by, by native birds and pelagic birds, uh, and the opportunity to restore that and to see a greater portion of the land back in its natural state is something that's been important to me my entire life. And so this is sort of the, the, the coming back around. It's the rounding out of my career and, and my efforts in environmental. Well, you know, a comment, you know, is a walking down the street, you don't look like an activist, short hair and all that, <laughs> presentable, <laughs> but, I, but, but you know what it, what it teaches me, and I'd really be interested in your reaction, is it teaches me that activists come in more than one flavor. It's hard to profile an activist as you see him walking down the street. And in fact, you can be an activist and do enormous things, enormously good things for the, for the land um, and the culture and, 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 and the sociology of the state um, by doing things other than what we would ordinarily classify as activism. You're another kind of activist, George. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Jay. And, and I really look at myself very much in that light. Um, I, uh, I was explaining to your producer yesterday that 
uh, one of the reasons I didn't stay in the uh, natural areas preservation area as a professional was that I realized the people who stayed in that profession actually had a very narrow range of accomplishment that was, that was even open to them. And I wanted to do greater things and larger things. And I've been very fortunate in my career to, uh, to address major national energy issues, uh, address uh, very specific segments of the economy, and, and make a significant difference in those segments, um, and make changes that are very large. And even in the natural areas uh, preservation, um, I was able early in my career to, to work on some things that, that uh, saved uh, 1,900 square miles. In the, in, the, in, the, in the central U.S. Thinking, thinking big. Yes. Uh, that's very hard for somebody who's in the field uh, doing field biology and things, which is what I thought initially yeah. was where I wanted yeah. to be. Um, but it's enabled me throughout my career to, to balance uh, the need for uh, um, financial success, which, which uh, is, is important in life, uh, and uh, preservation and enhancement of the natural environment, and I've been able to put those things together pretty well. So uh, I give you 65,000 acres, and the mission is to preserve it. What do you do to preserve it? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the $64 question, or $65,000 question, $65,000 uh, 65, acre question. The, it, it's actually um, complicated and simple at the same time. So uh, our, our executive director, Butch Haas, is wonderful on so many levels, but he, had, he fell in love, absolutely fell in love with native plants of Hawaii. And he has been able to identify a number of specimens within the area that was granted um, that we are now using as seed and rootstock for creation of a nursery of, of these plants. Uh, one, one plant, uh, an Ojai plant, was only one of 19 in the world when it was discovered. 19 plants, 19 individual plants, plants. In the world. And we're, there are now thousands of them because we've taken the seeds from that plant and, and, uh, and put them through the nursery. And soon, Ojai will just blanket large sections, as was described in um, uh, Captain early... Captain Cook. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, pretty much. It was uh, one of the, the, the uh, uh, missionaries in the 1700s yeah. described coming into this land that we now own as a carpet of these flowers that describe these red, red and green flowers. Oh, what a beautiful idea. And, and so preservation means to grow the natural flora and fauna on the land. Yes. So it's a historical, also a preservation thing, also a, a kind of return to a, a better ecology thing. Yes. And I remember walking on Molokai, you could stumble into lantana everywhere. And lantana, as I recall, was brought as a, kind of a substitute for barbed wire. Uh, to keep the cattle in one place or another, mm -hmm. and uh, it got out of control as so many, mm -hmm. uh, you know, invasive species mm -hmm. do. And um, how is, what's the condition of lantana these days, George? Well, lantana is one of our problem plants, and so we're constantly one of the one of the things that was always hard for me uh, in in work in biology was that that a lot of biology and a lot of preservation is killing things too. And so lantana is something that we're removing from the land. Uh, Kiave is really our, pardon the pun, thorn in our side. Um, <laughs> Kiave in this windswept, windswept region is bent over and dense and impenetrable. And so we, we carve our way in and then guys with chainsaws start at the back and they just slice layer after layer after layer off. And then you have to, uh, you have to paint the uh, the stumps, the stumps yeah. to, to make sure that they don't grow back. And uh, then we chip that and turn it into mulch, and then into that mulch we plant all of these native plants. Oh, how, oh wow, recycling, oh, that's yeah, wonderful. It's all right there in place. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a very, it's a great loop because we're, we're, not, we're not adding any problems to, to anything. We're simply providing back for the, the native plants a nice and idea. habitat that they can start it's with. It's ambitious. And expensive, no? It, it is. It is. And I was actually brought onto the board primarily for fundraising, for my connections to the business community and for uh, um, 
my uh, my passion for doing this kind of work and being able to convey that back to folks and get them excited about spending some money to 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 help with it. So segue this the money we're talking about is the business community here in Honolulu here in the state of Hawaii. Well, we're starting uh, we're starting here. We actually we actually started on Molokai with with the folks on Molokai, and we've been. Uh, um, the, although the land trust is six years old, we were in organizational phase and getting things going. A lot of a lot of grant monies were were used, and there was some base funding um, through some of the land deal work. Uh, but that's all pretty minor. So now we needed to expand in two ways. We need to expand our base of volunteers because the, the labor would be way too expensive if we bought. So you use volunteer it. labor. In addition, yeah, in addition to professional labor. Right. So the supervision kind of thing. Uh, uh, you know what we. <laughs> It's kind of funny that uh, folks have just started volunteering out there, so you know you never know where this will go. Um, but the big thing folks are very comfortable doing right now is weeding. You, you create these big bul uh, mulch beds and then you plant into them, but you have to keep the invasive plants to give it a chance yeah. as well, and, or, or they'll just take over everything. Yeah. And so uh, uh, we we have we have a, a number of friends, many of them in their 70s and 80s who just absolutely adore going out there and on their hands and knees picking weeds all day while they're kneeling in Chiave beds. And I'm like, how can you do this? <laughs> <laughs> you got to be really committed. They really love it. They really love These it. These are local people from Molokai, or do they come from elsewhere? A, a lot of them are uh, what we term snowbirds. They come for the winter. They have, many of these people have been coming for 30, 35 years, since the original development on the West End. Mm -hmm. um, and they just are, they're very excited about seeing some real preservation going on on Molokai and not just lip service to, uh, you know, uh, Malama Ainai, but actually putting the land back into the, into the condition. What a, what a great, I, I, you know, I don't think, I don't it. think people really know about this, George. I'm, I'm so glad you're here to tell them about it. Yeah. So how much money are we talking about? I mean, what kind of budget is the, is the uh, trust running? Oh, I think we uh, our current year operationally is uh, in the range of a quarter million dollars. Hmm. Uh, that funds the executive director, uh, a labor crew that's that's out on the land every day uh, chopping chiave. The heavy work like that is mm -hmm. is done not by volunteers but by people who are hired and and do the labor. Moving up the food chain from chiave uh, to deer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's famous worldwide. Uh, for Axis deer in the west end of Molokai. Mm -hmm. So how are the deer doing? The deer are doing far better than they need to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand what you mean by that. <laughs> uh, on the land trust, what we what we do is we fence areas that we're going to, to develop, and a lot of our grants have been uh, setting up fencing boundaries. Uh, it's been it's complicated because there are all kinds of rules about how you do fences and how near the shoreline and so forth. Uh, we've managed to work through all of those things, and we've actually we've fenced hundreds of acres to a degree. In terms of the restoration area, we have 40 acres right now, which is a really large plot uh, plot for a restoration. Mm -hmm. um, 40 acres has been isolated. Basically, no. Um, invasive species are getting through that fence at this point mm -hmm. and then we go work and it's all that was already uh, chipped and and and, uh, and spread and now that it's fenced we're planting and use that as a, a core right. somehow and then try to build it out right yeah right so uh, the, are, are the deer uh, you know uh, are they growing are they uh, are they in jeopardy? Uh, uh, the deer are very far from in jeopardy. Uh, the uh, um, I live on the west end, and and from my lanai, I've often watched herds of two to three hundred deer uh, come up the Avava and come up surround my house and then chew up all my landscaping. So <laughs> seems nice at the moment, but when they leave, something's missing. <laughs> they're they're extremely destructive, and, Interesting. and all of our neighbors are, are starting to work to to uh, construct fences and restrictions and oh. barriers. We have to restrict that deer population because uh, people look at the population as if it were something stable, but it is not. So if you have two hundred deer and there are there are uh, you know 30, 30 reproductive bucks and and one hundred and seventy does uh, next year. You can do the math. There will be at least at least another one hundred and fifty 
<coughs> that's pretty that's serious, uh, yeah. considering the fact that they do take something out of the land. They take a huge amount out of the land. They're very <coughs> destructive, and they, they're destructive for what they eat, and they're destructive because of the erosiveness of their hooves. You have to remember, these are non-natives. Yeah, I was just going to say, they're not indigenous at all. They, no. didn't grow, grow, they didn't grow in this environment. No, somebody brought them in for hunting, I guess. Well, you know, it's an... It's an the story I've been told, and, and I, I haven't gone back and verified it, but this is the story I've been told by Ricky and others who know the history of the island. Um, the West End was uh, a, uh, a kapu area of the kingdom before it was it was uh, sold slash granted to the Why? Cooks. Any particular reason? And it's where he put the gifts of animals, where the king put the gifts of animals, where there would be no hunting. But there hay so, in that area? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, very, very many. But it was, you could not go onto the land and harvest any of these animals, and he wanted them to, to uh, propagate, and they did far too well. Uh, so No enemies. Exactly. No, no predators whatsoever, and uh, so the deer absolutely now will look out, and, and it reminds my wife and me of, of uh, the, the, the Serengeti in Kenya. You just look out, and the herd of deer go by like a herd of antelope and uh, it's quite spectacular on the one hand on the other hand you know the consequences of it yeah, it's a little bit yeah that's so interesting so how, how do you thin the herd do you allow hunting uh, hunting has to be allowed at some level uh, there has been serious discussion of um, a, uh, a purge where you, you go through and and extirpate the deer from from an area it's sort of super hunting right right and and Everybody wants that to be a harvest, not a not just destructive, uh, and all of that turns out to be very complicated to get done and agreed upon by the community. And, and we've been since I since I arrived, it was in discussion for ten years before I arrived. So it's probably twenty five or thirty years of talking about it, and every year the deer population just keeps increasing and increasing. True, but I mean, I can imagine people for whatever reason, maybe it's cultural or who knows what, but at the core of it, uh, it's hard to kill an animal that is so pretty. Right. Uh, that is so sweet. Uh, I remember, this is years ago, probably before you were born. <laughs> I went hunting with one of the Cook family over there, and I had my rifle with me. And uh, they were all bagging deer but me. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I would get the deer in my crosshairs, but I couldn't pull the trigger. I, I, I never I, I, could I, I, do I, it. <laughs> I, I, that, that was another reason I didn't go into biology. I really have a hard time killing things, so yeah. I, I have the same problem. But you know, it, it, um, the, the issue is is uh, it, it's getting to one of those unpleasant kill or be killed kind of situations at this point. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the deer are overrunning, and it starts to destroy the deer themselves because they become subject to instead of predators to disease. Uh, and so then that's very sad. Right, and it's much harder to watch starvation during this last drought. Um, we were in the position of being um, emotionally torn because the deer would come up and, and eat all of the landscaping uh, that they could get to at our house. And extremely destructive. Um, every morning we'd get up and at, in the middle of the night we'd hear them crunching on the landscaping outside our bedroom window. Uh, but we also knew that based on the plants they were selecting, they were extremely desperate. They were going first for the ones that had high water content and then they were just taking anything that they could they could get anything. Oh, that's sad. And it, it, yeah, it's it's just painful to, to think of how difficult that life that life is. Yeah. Well, but it opens up a, a segue I'd like to talk to you about, and that is the you you mentioned that you wouldn't do anything with these deer without con, 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 consulting with the community. And it strikes me that no organization in the land of Molokai is going to be successful unless it does exactly that. Correct. So, can you tell us how that works? It's a very challenging process. Uh, we have a, a, a board we hope is reasonably representative of the community, but it's it's really a small number of people. Uh, we keep constant communications uh, back and forth to the various uh, elements of the community and their leadership. Um, it's a funny island in the sense that, that uh, uh, often it feels as if each person feels they must be consulted personally on, on anything you want to do, and, it, and that can be frustrating, of course. Um, well, what, just to hesitate on that one point, what, what is, where does that come from, do you think, culturally or 
psychologically or sociologically? Where does it come from that every individual feels at some level that he needs or she needs to be consulted? I just don't know. I think it's because it's in other places in the state too. And I, I'm not sure that it's been around for that long. It has seemed to have germinated in the past 10, 20 years maybe. You know? yeah. It has certainly been here but has grown in intensity in, yeah. in the dozen years yeah. I've been on Mobile Cup. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I don't know. But I wanted to touch on that because this is the, the, you know, the subject for another discussion sure, in much absolutely. greater detail. And it's an increasing challenge uh, for getting anything done in yeah. the islands um, and, and that's, that's often what, what we feel. Uh, so our, our response to that is to create a positive environment, uh, a sense of accomplishment, uh, get some things done that are well within the scope of the general description of what we're supposed to do and we're going to bring those successes back to the community. The other thing that we're doing a lot of and I'm very proud of it uh, Butch has been great in bringing out school groups, and we now have a volunteer who's going to orchestrate uh, island-wide. Is this from Kanakakai or, or from other islands? Well, all from Molokai. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have five grade schools, and it's really the grade schools that are most involved in mm -hmm. this. And we have five, five public grade schools and a, a, sixth, uh, a sixth school that's a private school. And we're, we're trying to bring all of the students in the... In, in the in the primary years out and establish projects that allow them to have a sense of continuity uh, plant plants so that every every class has a group of plants and but they're tasked with taking care of the prior years as well and they can they can have a sense that um, every year this responsibility uh, grows but with it grows the reward of of seeing a, a mature native plant that, that they can they can bond yeah. with yeah um, so that that actually goes right to, you know, their worldview, and it's I'm sure there's a lot of resonance on it. But you mentioned this one school; it's a private school. Where yes. Does, where does that come from? I hadn't heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, the school is called Akaula School, and mm -hmm. you, you might have heard of it a few years ago. Uh, um, I, I was the founding chairman of the board of the school. Ricky Cook was the, the vice chairman of that board. Uh, we've been co-conspirators for a long time. <laughs> it's elementary school. It, it was a middle school. Middle school. And when we started it, that was the, that was the perceived gap on Molokai. Uh, there is a, a serious issue of, of parents not being happy with their kids going to uh, um, the intermediate school, the, the seventh and eighth grade school. And so um, we set, established a fourth, fifth, seventh, sixth, hmm. four, I'm sorry, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, school at that time that would uh, allow parents a, a, an option to sending, particularly sending uh, their children from sixth grade over to the high school campus and, and encountering all of the, the challenges there. I keep there. thinking of that quote you see at the bottom of email once in a while. It says, a few committed individuals can change the world. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely committed, George. <laughs> well, I loved the, the, the teachers in the curriculum that, that uh, we started with at Akaula. The teachers really brought us the idea, and I had volunteered in the in the public school where the teachers taught until No Child Left Behind. When No Child Left Behind and, and uh, uh, Kualapu'u School was going to be taken over and turned into one of those uh, those managed uh, affairs, they were going to lose this curriculum that actually worked and actually got the kids involved and actually brought kids up. Um, Kids tended to come in reading first, second, third grade, and come out reading sixth grade out of their two, out of their two-year fifth and sixth grade classes. That's terrific. Um, and I worked with some of those kids. They were excited about everything. They had, uh, they were interested in economic development. That's what I was, I was advising them on environmentally acceptable economic development. They came up with great ideas. It was fantastic. And when that is, was is going there a to, high school? There was no, no, no those are. Uh, but is school. there a high school? Oh, is, the there is a high school, but it's very minor from this private school. It's okay. just a, maybe I think six or eight students right now. Okay. Trying to trying to build that. It's just started. I think okay. last year or the previous year. But it's a you know it's a great opportunity to build that sensibility of uh, combined environmental opportunity and these teachers are very committed to all of the basics and so the kids test very high. Um, early on, the the outcomes were great. We were getting a lot of kids placed out into into private high schools and and uh, uh, either to uh, Punahou or Kamehameha, and so we were seeing a lot of a lot of success. Uh, 
Uh, that's fallen off a little bit. A lot of the families, just because of economics, can't afford to put their kids into the private schools and they're, they're going into the high school. And the problem that I've realized, I talk to these kids from time to time as the years pass, and, and several of them have come back and said, well, we got to high school and I just cruised. I learned everything they were going to teach me at the high school by the time I got there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> So, you know, uh, people people in Oahu anyway, I don't know, other islands, how they perceive Molokai, and I do want to spend some time talking to you about that. Um, I, I, would be, I would be worried about the educational system in Molokai because it could turn in on itself and become isolated the way it seems that a lot of people are in Molokai, you know, and sort of fold in on itself and, and push off from the rest of the state and the world. So how are those kids handling that kind of uh, isolation, isolation versus uh, you know, world awareness? Well, there's a real tension in the community, I think, uh, Jay, that, that folks who hang around educational institutions a little bit get a pretty clear sense of. Um, as you know, there's been a strong upsurge in, in at least lip service to subsistence existence. Yeah. And, uh, at the same time, there are plenty of families, uh, in fact, um, most people perceive the majority of, of folks want their children to succeed in the, in the global economy. They don't want them to just succeed in terms of, of uh, a subsistence life. Yes. And so we see that same tension coming through the school and we see, uh, we see problems. Uh, we, we had a Hanai son who went through the, the high school and... and uh, uh, this is the... Private, uh, public, the, the public, Scotland, yeah, public yeah. high school, and and we could see through the teacher interactions and so forth that exactly what you're concerned about does go on, and there's there's an increasing sympathy in the public school system to the subsistence way, and a dismissal of the of the needs for the other performance factors that will make those children competitive on a global market. That puts it on the parents then to uh, motivate their children and guide their children. And many of the parents I know, even with their children in public schools, feel they can get an excellent education on Molokai. But the parents have to work with the teachers. They have to, every step of the way, guide the child through to make sure that they're hitting all of the topics they'll need as adults. Yeah. Well, somebody has to work then with the parents. Right. And right now, the problem is that you only have those highly educated parents, and it's a small community on Molokai that can, that can guide their children that way. The vast majority of parents were not well educated themselves, can't do that for their children. You know, I, that's another interesting sociological point. When I came to these islands, which was in the 60s, I was delighted with the fact that everything was vertically open, horizontally open, too. I mean, everybody. Open. <laughs> every, it was open. It was, a, it, was, it was a nirvana that way. Everybody was friendly about everything. People were so giving. I mean, on all levels of it. Yes. Uh, and that's built into the Kama Aina thing now still today. But, yes. you know, as, as we had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kama Aina come from other places where Malahini come and make themselves Kama Aina, it, it sort of changed it a little bit. And, and over the past X years, um, it, has, it has become less, less vertical. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a dichotomy between rich and poor, landed and not landed, and right. so forth. Right. Um, and so on, on Molokai, you know, people see Molokai as that subsistence model you talk about, and it surprises them sometimes. I remember I, I met the uh, your Chamber of Commerce, the Chief of the Chamber of Commerce, who I like very much. Mm -hmm. Rob. Uh, yes, Rob. And um, I thought, well, you know, maybe there's another strata there in Molokai. Uh, and you're definitely in that other strata. I mean, you, 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 you come from somewhere else, you bring great gifts, but you're not in the subsistence farming area, <laughs> okay? My question is, <clears throat> is there, I mean, what's the tension there in general? Uh, and is it, is, it, is it peaceful coexistence? Is it intermingling? Uh, what is the relationship between those two stratas? Well, certainly, uh, I, I say peaceful coexistence is the minimum, and it actually extends beyond that. Most of the folks I know who have uh, landed on Molokai as, as, as uh, Malahini and then are transitioning to Kama Aina are doing so with a great deal of, of cultural sensitivity. Um, the churches play a huge function in that integration and uh, by all appearances do a good job with it. People work together hand in hand on, on shared interests in the, in the churches. Um, 
and I've worked more in um, in, in secular activities. Uh, I'm part of a, a, a musical band. We, we we play every week at Coffees of Hawaii. You, you are a very busy person, George. And, uh, oh, I just have a lot of fun. Uh, but that band has been a huge uh, element in in terms of social integration. Uh, it introduces the Malahini to uh, some of the aspects of of uh, uh, what most folks think of as traditional Hawaiian culture, and then it also, because of the way we present it, we, we give people a songbook every week they can play from. We invite them to bring their ukuleles to the, to the event. It isn't run as a kanakapila; we run it as a performance. Mm -hmm. But it's almost it's a crossover between kanakapila, an educational experience, and a and a musical performance. Um, we have large audiences every week, and we have a blast with it. Those things make a huge difference to the local community because a lot of the locals will come. They'll send their ch children to learn ukulele by playing with us uh, because they have the song books, they have the chords, and they have the words, and, and they're hard to uh, access other ways. Those things have a long effect. You know, they cast a long shadow on young lives, on everyone's life. I, I remember uh, going to uh, visit a friend in uh, Eugene, Oregon, Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, you have to come out to the Concapilla on Friday night because we always have a Concapilla on Friday night here in Eugene, Oregon. Right. Okay. Well, a hundred people showed up, right. all with, uh, you know, uh, ukuleles, <laughs> all kinds of instruments. And, and they played from the heart, and it was, it was so touching. Yes. I recorded it. I still have the sound file for that. But, you know, suffice to say, it was more than music, way more than music. And uh, it brings people together. That's what brought people together in the '60s, don't you think? You I know? do, I do, I do. And it was it was the power that that uh, had the resurgence of, of Hawaiian culture. I, I, music and dance are the things that that, that brought all of that forward. Yeah. And so uh, that's an important part of, of yeah. what we do. So in in our lives, my wife and I are always looking for ways to to touch the culture in a in a positive way, not to leave a footprint, but to to contribute what we contribute without, without trying to displace or, or upset the apple cart, and to be respectful of it. I told you in the, uh, in the third part of our, the, in the third quarter of our discussion here, I want to talk <laughs> about the, uh, you know, sometimes we call it the dark side, but uh, talk about the challenges sure. and the frustrations. Um, you know, I'm sure it's not easy. Some of the things that happen for you in Molokai. <laughs> well, that's life. Um, you know, there. <laughs> Uh, very little about life has really been easy, so <laughs> there's not a lot of surprise there. Um, the, uh, the, the opportunities, uh, I think, outweigh the challenges, but the challenges are considerable. You know, number one is, uh, uh, and, and Aka'ula School and the Land Trust share this, the, the Molokai is a very limited arena for raising fund. So fundraising is, is it has to be thought of in a in a bigger a bigger perspective, and then the question is, what can you bring outward that will motivate people to to uh, contribute? And uh, so that that is one of our big challenges. Um, and so, for example, uh, on our board of directors, Ricky Cook, as you may know, was a National Geographic photographer, an outstanding photographer. Um, his close friend, my close friend, Dewitt Jones, another National Geographic photographer. Um, and uh, there's a lot of photogenic things to take in Molokai. Spectacular. Yeah. And so, uh, as a fundraiser, as sort of the, the, the crescendo of our first effort at fundraising this year, uh, we're holding a photo safari in which DeWitt and, and Ricky will uh, have a, a combination of a, a seminar, uh, there will be a, a dinner at my house, and then before dawn, we'll take everybody out on a safari to Mokio, and they'll photograph the sunrise, which is nothing short of amazing at Mokio. Uh, photos of these these amazing cliffs and uh, watching the, the where is that birds come out? Uh, that's on the north. The the, the, the land oh, trust is over, the north shore, overlooking Kalapapa. Yeah, it's um, it's it's west of Kalapapa. So if you've been to a Leo Point. Yeah. The land trust runs from the edge of the state property there, basically to Mo'omomi, uh, which is the large beach area. Yeah. You know, that is a reference point. That's, that's a good, that's good a reference huge point. huge beach, huge. And 
that five miles in between is the is the land trust shoreline. We have five miles of shoreline, it's 1,800 the acres. Best shoreline in the state, in it's, my opinion. It's extremely isolated. It's extremely well preserved. It's it's so isolated that it's preserved itself. And so much so much sand. You know, really a deep beach. It's, in some places, it looks like 50 yards, 100 yards of sand. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And the 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 Mokio stretch is all cliff. We have no sand beach in our in our chunk. Um, but it's very spectacular, and from points on the land trust, you can see Kalau Papa in the distance. Mm. So it's just as the land sweeps up, yes. as, as the cliffs begin. Yes, yeah. well, as, the, as, the, as the large sea cliffs begin. But it, you know, you don't, you don't think of them as cliffs, but they're two or three hundred feet straight down. And when you're standing on them, it's a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to fall down it. <laughs> it's interesting flying over it because the land seems like a carpet along the flat side it, there. It looks flat, but it is it, no, anything right. but when you're on the ground. It's, uh, <laughs> right. it's very hard land to traverse, and it's very, very... Uh, so this translates into a, a, a frustration somehow? Yeah, though the frustration is just uh, getting out, getting people to hear it, um, getting people to participate, focus. You know, people are so busy today, even if they, if the idea of the land trust fascinates them or pulls their heartstrings, uh, the notion that they can commit the time or the money to, to uh, doing something about it is, is a very difficult challenge. Um, you know, the other challenges of, on Molokai are, are very practical, and most of them we, we solve one way or another, but um, they come at a, typically a, a very high cost, uh, transportation of, of materials and equipment in very high cost. Uh, availability of skilled labor, um, uh, very challenging, uh, and uh, holding people on Molokai, keeping them, uh, keeping talented people on Molokai is a challenge. Sure, people. the kids in the school, yeah, are the not kids likely to stay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, when I first arrived, I had done a lot of work in West Virginia in in uh, in a previous company, and uh, it, it reminded me so much of doing work in in West Virginia. Uh, were there too. If there was a bright kid, out they went. There was the immediate brain drain. Any anybody with skills left, and the the remainder tended to keep lowering the standards of what they were doing. And, yeah. and I see that same pattern um, playing through on on Molokai with rays of hope. But but that's that's the difficult pattern. And I think there's you know there's a. There's the thought that uh, Molokai and Lanai could be compared on this, and I suppose to some extent they could be, but it's not a perfect comparison, is it? Culturally, it's not. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of that has to do with the history of the islands, uh, where Lanai became so domin dominated by uh, the, the, the plantation uh, industry that the population really shifted. Molokai is around 70% Hawaiian, part Hawaiian, and it makes a really profound difference in the cultures that we have. It's also a much, uh, a much less compliant society. It's much, it's much more like the Wild West when you when you get down to how rules are, rules are set and followed. Yeah, gee, it must be it must be interesting because just you know, you made an entry and it worked well, and I'm sure that some other people did because of the way they operate. I mean, Rob Stevenson, for example, mm -hmm. it strikes me that he. He can walk the line perfectly and understand it and relate to both sides of the equation. But for some people, it must be very hard to come to Molokai and try to settle and not fully understand. Oh, absolutely. There is no question. And uh, that is, uh, it, it, there, there are two kinds of folks who come and have a difficult time, I think, in general. Uh, one, when people look at real estate prices in Hawaii, they see the low prices on Molokai, and a lot of the beachfront front property, in particular, was sold to folks who go, "This is so cheap, I can't, I can't pass this up." <laughs> and then they get there, and it's like, "What did I get into here?" <laughs> and you know, you've seen that in some high-profile cases, uh, McAfee being uh, yeah, a, a, yeah. a great high-profile <laughs> example of not being able to uh, adapt to the, the culture. Um, and a lot of those those kinds of economic decisions are those are the things that the locals resent the most, and those are the things that you know the, that right. that's the greatest class differentiation right. uh, uh, difficulty. Yeah. Uh, the other is you really have to love a rural lifestyle. You have to be self-sufficient. 
And uh, if you're expecting the world to entertain you, it's not Molokai. But if you're willing to be part of that entertainment, then you're always busy and always enjoying. And, and uh, uh, I always equate it, I, I if you remember the Star Wars series where the, the Ewok village came on and they had this big party going and the drums were beating and people were dancing. and that's that. The, the nearer Molokai is to, to life in the Ewok village, the happier everyone is. It and takes if you me can back to the '60s. To it's not dissimilar from the you know the Gamutlakite of the '60s. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but I, I do want to you know go down this track and ask you about um, you know how it works on the economy of Molokai. Uh, forget about beachfront property. Come over and start a business, uh, expand an existing business into Molokai, open something on the main street of Kanakakai, try to make a living. Uh, I, I suspect it's not that easy. Uh, no, it's it's not something I would uh, recommend to anyone. Um, it, especially this this recession has been very deep and 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 powerful for Molokai. And while the rest of the state has has risen back up and. You know, I, I often stay in, uh, on Waikiki when I'm here. Uh, it, it's it's crazy busy. I mean, it's beyond what it's ever been. But on Molokai, uh, it's still well below what it's ever been, and um, it's a it, it's tough. There's just not enough money on the island to make anything work as a business there. Is there? But <clears throat> you know, you wonder. It's self-inflicted in many ways. Uh, you know, because I think people they they as a community don't want to be they don't want to be involved they don't want people coming over from the same same thing on lanai and maybe to, to a, another degree the same thing on all the neighbor islands you know but especially molokai and um do they realize that in in say rejecting tourism and cruise ships and fishing boats and whatever else might come over those those tour boats the issue last year um do, do they realize that they're they're actually containing their their economy in a, in a small box? You know, Jay, it's a it's a complicated and 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 difficult cultural question, and and it has so many roots. Some of them deep in Hawaiian culture, uh, some of them fairly recent, uh, and some of them keyed to the degree of the welfare economy on the island. Uh, all of those things make locals there feel often from what they've told me that these are these are invaders trying to steal things from them not economic not folks bringing economic value to them and so the whole equation is is just shifted on its ear at an emotional level uh, and there is no sense that I have that that uh, that portion of the the community that is so vocal about this um, understands in any way that that they're they're cutting their own throats that that the very things that they want to have on the island can't be on the island if they don't allow some of these things to happen. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be a controlled growth, uh, a controlled um, you know uh, arrival, but I uh, my sense of it is that it's it's not that either. It's no. And uh, this, that could get a different result that way. I think. I think that's the. That's certainly, the the surface perception. It's easy to easy to see that part of it. Uh, I think that there are, there are so many layers to this. The people saying absolutely no is actually a fairly small group. The the people saying, don't screw it up. That's everybody. And so, uh, the the problem is. That both the way, the 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 degree of activism and 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 uh, public presence of the people who say absolutely no, my job is to say no. Um, those uh, that presence is what is perceived outwardly, while really I believe that the majority of families trying to make their way, the majority of people trying to uh, work a job and and keep things going are on the cautious, don't screw it up, you know, let's let this happen carefully so that we can, we can do it. That, that cruise ship is a great example. There was a plan, that, that whole process of the Laau point that I talked about at first, uh, when, when that blew up, 
some of the community members got together and wrote a plan. I was not part of that group, but the the the, the most vigorous activists who had opposed Lao wrote a, a positive plan. You know, because we're always saying no, we're going to say positively what we can do. That cruise ship was very explicitly defined as one of the things that should be allowed, and so all of us who had been involved in the Lao thing went back and went, oh, guys, you know, if you say no here and then you say, but you can do these things, and we all go, well, okay, that's, you know, we'll, we'll start there. But then you say no to the very things you said could be done, then that's a real problem. And, and I think that's where uh, the, the island sits right now, where domination of, of the public dialogue by a relatively small number of very vocal people uh, has been carried to an extreme on the island. Yeah. Well, I, we have about 10 minutes left, and I, I did want to get to my favorite subject, which you can guess is energy. Uh, <clears throat> and I wonder, um, you know, what you can help, how you can help us understand the dynamic on Molokai. And since, you know, uh, we're talking about land in large part, I mean, I, I feel bad for first wind. I, I thought they should have gotten a place and and, uh, and, they, and I think they're a good company with a good ethic and care about public opinion and so forth. But um, they, they lost that and, and uh, the big wind project sort of fell down because of that. And Molokai was the, was the first, you know, it was a domino thing. It was the first chip to fall and a lot of other things happened after that. But <clears throat> will there ever be, uh, you know, real clean energy on Molokai? Uh, well, I think the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, I don't think it will be wind, and from a local perspective and from my perspective as, as somebody uh, oriented to the land trust and the, the, the natural lands and natural features of the land, the wind project as we understood it, as it was proposed, was not clean. Um, it had huge environmental impacts on, on Molokai. Uh, the, uh, and the, the sort of glib handling of wind as a clean energy, I think, is a, is a, a serious mistake on a national level that we're making. Now, um, just, you know, we haven't talked about my business, but I, my career has been primarily in energy. And so I saw my first wind farm when I was, uh, I was an asset manager for a, a state energy development fund in Illinois back in the, in the 70s. And I was uh, working with the Electric Power Research Institute. They took me to the wind farm um, outside of Palm Springs. I got out of the car and I felt the ground vibrate and said, mm, let's be a little bit careful here. This is, not, this is not a good thing. There's a real problem here. You could feel the, the base vibrations through. And my sensitivity, because I work with natural lands, because I've always had a focus on natural lands, uh, is that the, the wind initiatives have been poorly thought out uh, in terms of unintended consequences. Uh, you know, every, every technology has unintended consequences. The production of solar panels is very uh, environmentally uh, un unpleasant. Uh, it can be controlled, uh, but you know, and when you look at, at all of the energy ranges from the extreme of nuclear power to, uh, to uh, uh, bicycling, every single one of them has some aspect that has uh, an environmental impact to them. And solar is you know, actually pretty far up there in terms of, of if you didn't control the, the manufacturing process, what would happen. Um, but wind has a long-term impact. Solar, once you've controlled the manufacturing process, which you do at one point, then has very low impact uh, as deployed. Did I, I see an op-ed piece from you on this subject? I, just, I saw an op-ed piece from somebody in Molokai on this subject. Yeah, that was uh, Mike Bond. Yes, and who has, who has uh, experience also in energy, as I yes, recall. Yes, yes, he's, he's run, a, uh, run, run a, a number of uh, utility uh, and utility support companies. Uh, and, and Mike and I have met on these topics, and, and we're in, in significant agreement. Um, I think that you know the, the transition and the, the opportunity on Molokai for the future for energy uh, is a really excellent laboratory for uh, something that's become a bit of a, a buzzword: a smart microgrid, uh, basically neighborhood-level electronic grids, so that the information is shared back and forth all the way from the end user to the producer 
with storage systems and so forth. And so you transition the energy system from you buy oil, you store it in a tank, you burn it in an, in an engine, you generate the power and you ship it out and people use it and you just turn the engine up and down a little bit as you go and there's a lot of waste in the system and the transmission is, is huge to a little grid here, a little grid there with just an interconnection between those two and the next one and the next one. And so Molokai is small enough that that experiment could be done and shown to work for, for a population um, and could be a, an absolute model for Hawaii of how to eliminate... A laboratory. Eliminate I mean, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Fossil fuel. The prob use. problem is, I mean, correct me, but right now Molokai is working on oil. Uh, just as Lanai right now is working on oil. And the oil comes by, I guess, by ship. By barges. And uh, the, I guess, the uh, the facilities are run by Hawaiian Electric as a part of Maui Electric. Is Correct. that what it is? Um, and if you say, uh, and they wanted to have big wind, that was a big thing. Um, and if you say to them, well, no big wind, no windmills at all. Uh, we want to do microgrid. How would you like to fund it? They would probably say no. Don't you think? Well, I think that's the challenge in all of this. Um, can we find ways uh, that the utility, uh, given the revised rate structure after the decoup decoupling, if there's a way that the utility can uh, uh, fall in love with this technology, that's the best of all worlds. Um, and that's the future for all of all of this. I mean, it will, it will trans transform the islands one way or another. Yeah, not only Molokai. That's right. And the, the, the question we have to ask, and, and, and when I sat down with the governor on this issue, I, my statement to him was, the direction with big wind, the direction with the cable, is to repeat a hundred plus year old model of how utilities run and to persist in the mistaken notion that we can integrate all these technologies in that model. And that's, a, that's flawed reasoning. We no longer are restricted technologically to that straightforward massive grid model that that is implied by those cables and central generation plants. But it will take rethinking the way we think about utility systems and finding the institutional corrections. The barriers are no longer technical. The technology is there, it's just fine. And, and it can be worked out without you know, much more than experience-based changes that need to be made. The issue is institutional. And we have set up institutions that for more than 100 years have supported this model. And now we're asking those institutions to rethink themselves, the funding structure behind them, and how that structure interfaces with the general population. We're asking for all of those things to make this transition. Yet if we don't, we probably will never accomplish our departure from fossil fuels. We'll instead always be looking um, at the lowest cost fossil fuel or, or potentially even nuclear uh, solution to sustain uh, a decrepit and out-of-date model. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Interesting, you know, kind of voice in the mix, if you will. So we have a, mo a minute or two left, uh, and I, it's unfair, but I wanted to ask you the question that comes out of that, and that is, how do we get there? Uh, if, you, if I make you king or governor or <laughs> mayor of Molokai, how, how do you do that, George? It doesn't sound real easy to me. Uh, well, I, you know, I've, I've proposed, but nobody's taken me up on some very simple things, which is to allow, allow the evolution of, of uh, microgrids uh, on, a, on a community level, create a law which allows uh, rate payers to come together and form a microgrid with a certain number of criteria in terms of their interaction with the utility so, so that they can... Cooperative like in KIUC. Uh, that's right. The trick is where does where does the utility fit into that and that you know the utility has to exist and it has to there has to be some uh, entity that's that's larger than than parts uh, but 
that that is uh, as yet unresolved. The question is, if you let the microgrids evolve, uh, will then the institution uh, be driven to, to correct that? And I believe it will be. So that's my, that's my sort of simple-minded solution, which is let it happen, uh, because right now we won't. Well, it deserves further discussion, George. Thank you so much for coming down. I hope we get to talk again, and I wish you well. Well, thank you, Jay. It's been a pleasure. George. <laughs> Boy, I wish we allowed more time for that. <laughs> we could have got into it. <laughs> wow, that was awesome. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I hope your audience appreciates it. Oh. Enjoys it. High quality stuff. Thank you for that. Super high quality. Oh my God. Mr. Bender, you're so eloquent. Oh, thank you. Thank you.